Hello everyone, and welcome to another Beyond Words, where the elite meet to critique the chic, and if you know where that's from, then d I'm so sorry. You might have noticed I did a new B-Mask doodle. Uh, pretty happy going forward with this guy for branding purposes. Kind of a little carnival barker fella. I just wanted something that covered a general sense of theatricality and entertainment and storytelling and all that highfalutin guff. You guys like it? No? Oops. So, my Sly 2 video has been and gone, and the response was nothing short of wonderful. I've been worrying over it since February when I decided to start this, and I'm super appreciative of everyone who stopped by to watch it. It's one of the few videos I've done where I'm really proud of the final product. I mean, I still have a lot of technical issues with it, like that over there, but it seems like everyone's responding the way I actually aimed for, and that's very validating. Yay! I'm really excited to dive into Sly 3 again, and, and I've been working on that since February too. Uh, it's got the least development info to find, so I'm stretching myself a bit to make sure I'm getting stuff right and not misleading you on the game's intentions and the like. I, I was surprised to see how divided people are on 3. Some people think it's the best in the series, and some think it's the lowest point. I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say I like it a lot, um, maybe I might even consider it misunderstood, but I will of course get to some of its shortcomings, so don't worry, I will give it a fleshed out send off. It'll be, uh, reasonably balanced, I think. Problem is, I, I kind of burnt out on working on the Sly 2 video, so I figured it was time to spice things up and do a couple of different projects. One of which is this Q&A that I'm doing, uh, based on a couple questions people asked me on Twitter. Uh, it was really fun doing the last one, so I thought, why not dive back in headfirst and... and... And there's no second part to that sentence, let's fucking do it. You once made a comment that games have more in common with theatre than movies. Would you be willing to expand on that? Sure. I, I haven't formed a complete theory on this. Uh, I had a couple of people mention it in passing in the past, but uh, they've never elaborated on it. And I've been thinking about it for a couple years now. I, I can give you a rough idea of my thoughts. So, movies and games and theatre obviously have a lot in common. They are pre-scripted, pre-planned, and pre-rehearsed in some way or another. Theatre is, however, adaptive, reactive, and lives off the input of the audience. So, on that principle, it's very much like video games. I'll concede that most mainstream theatre is kind of treated like a movie, but there are still a lot of unpredictable factors that come with a live space movies can't recreate. The energy an audience can give off through their reactions, uh, directing their attention without cuts and different angles, people maybe getting their lines wrong, etc. It's, it's about diverting their attention and immersing them in the uh, experience, and obviously the closest form of theatre to video games that employs that is immersive theatre, as the name suggests. That's stuff like experimental audience participation, dinner shows, theme parks, improv. This is a form of entertainment that has to adapt to the circumstances you bring to it. There's a set programme, but the scenario has to revolve around the guest's participation. There's a broader argument about how games and theatre share a closer sense of a heightened reality too. Uh, a movie is sort of saying, this really happened by everything being a very literal uh, document of the past tense. Whereas in a game or theatre show, we know that things are either clearly compensating for a live reality, or they're totally in our control because, you know, it's in a live space. There's no possible way any of this can be interpreted as something that has already happened. In a, in a very broad sense, obviously, we could be really pedantic and break down all the instances where that's not true, but I think, by and large, it's that sort of live performance factor that, that brings them together on the most basic level. And the reactivity of dealing with, um, you know, those unpredictable factors. I, I don't think this is a very definitive explanation, uh, is, is there a loose series of ideas, is very smelly, but I do think there's grounds for a smart person to take some of these ideas and run away with their own theories and debates. Especially when, you know, theatre is borrowing a lot from video game terminology, there's no reason why it shouldn't be the other way around. So let's do that. Let's all get it going. Uh, um, mm, good talk. What are the worst Spider-Man stories in comics you know of? And what do you think of the amazing Spider-Man changing hands? Dan Slott to Nick Spencer? Man, uh, it's only gonna be what other people have said, to be honest. Clone Saga, Sins Past, One More Day, Chapter One, nothing terribly surprising, I'm, I'm not that exciting. Instead, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about some of the runs I really do like, uh, that don't get talked about enough. J.M. Dematius' stuff after the Clone Saga, uh, Todd DeZargo kind of around the same era, uh, Marvel Knight Spider-Man, one of the reminders that Mark Miller is actually a very competent writer. Yeah, I know, you got reasons to believe that that's not the case. 
Mm. There's there's a ton of really good Spider-Man stories out there, so maybe I need to have a look at those and, and see what else I can recommend. For those who don't know, uh, I'm not a fan of Dan Slott. I've got a bit of a history with him that I'm not really all that proud of, but I stand by uh, my overall points about him as a writer. I think he has terrific ideas that are all marred by horrible dialogue or just don't feel like they're going anywhere consequential. I actually did go back and read most of Superior um, long after the fact, and I can't say I felt that one anywhere either. I'm also up and down on Nick Spencer. Uh, Superior Foes has some great gags and moments, but the characterization feels a bit weak. It gets kind of obnoxious at certain points. Now, I haven't actually read issue one yet. I, I did read the free comic book day one, which had a spot on status quo set up and just the trashiest dialogue, but I hear the actual issue one is pretty good. So I'm currently looking to pick that up and see if I agree. It's fine, you know, the movies are good again. Uh, Mysterio is gonna be in the next one, hallelujah. And the, the animated movie, by the Lego Movie guys look super interesting, so I'm sorted. Whatever, man. I don't give a fuck. While I'm talking comic books, um, I'd also highly recommend Tom King's The Vision, because hot damn is that a good book. Jack Trilogy or Ratchet Trilogy? And what games out of the past few years do you think will be classics over time? I gotta go with Ratchet, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of Jack, I think that's a good series of games, but it's got a huge number of identity issues just with its main uh, characters and its its visual style, whereas Ratchet really holds together in every department. It, it's got its issues, but it's got a really strong theme and visual style that runs through all three games. Just a solid sense of cohesion that makes everything really easy to grasp and understand. I think you could describe uh, to someone what Ratchet is a lot quicker than you could Jack. I think it's just more saleable. It's why I'm okay with something like the existence of all the Air sequels. Like, of course something that appealing is going to produce a ton more games. I will do a video on Jack at some point, especially the third one, because that's, well, you know, that would be telling. As for games that I think will be modern classics, gosh. I don't know that I'm the best person to answer this. I don't think I played nearly enough games in the last couple years. Um, obviously I play a lot, but I, I haven't played a lot of new stuff in the way other people have to really be the best judge of character on this. I mean, Journey really stood out to me. I thought that was, uh, I guess it was a while ago, but something in reasonably recent memory that I'm fond of. Uh, Doom could go down really well later on. Cuphead, Shovel Knight, uh, Wonderful 101, though that's definitely more of a cult classic. I, I think about Breath of the Wild already uh, more than I do the last couple Zeldas, so that's probably a candidate for some people. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think other people will have a better answer, so it, this is a good question. Let's share it with everyone else. What's your thoughts? There, shirked that responsibility for a bit. I am a good person. What's a question you wish someone would ask you? Like, you have a whole response planned out and you just need someone to ask it first. You you just don't get it, man, okay? Gem and the Holograms has huge potential to work. It just needs the right person directing it and I promise you it'll be so good! Uh, my problem is that if I have it written down, if the question is kind of on my mind or somebody's asked me it and, and I think it's a big topic, chances are it's gonna already be written down to become a video or already is a video. I, I use videos kind of like an exorcism. If something's really got me going, then that's where it's going to get released. So the rest of the time I just walk around with my little bug brain just going from place to place normally. But who knows, if you ask the right question, you might get an interesting answer uh, that I wouldn't have expected, and then it would probably get written into a video. Also, Universal Appeal is a god tier song. Any plans on doing other projects you wanted to make besides more BP videos? Too many plans. Far too many plans. I'm working on ideas for projects all the time, but I just can't settle. I have no confidence to release anything I've done unless it's been workshopped to absolute death in my brain first. I, I wanted to write a couple of musicals for years, but I can't write music, and I haven't found anyone that I gel with as a musical collaborator, so you know, that's a big problem. Uh, one thing I really wanted to do was the radio play or something. Uh, just something I'd have written myself that can exist out of my brain in the most basic form. But even then, I ran into a couple of speed bumps. Uh, I wanted to cut my teeth on an existing story or, or series of characters, but it just ended up feeling like fan fiction, so I discarded that. You know, I I've debated also doing a basic stage play just to get things started maybe at the fringe or something, but I'm, I'm terrified I won't hack it and everything I write kind of falls apart, so uh, I'm really trying to apply the work ethic that I have to my videos in that department as well, but um, 
It's it's difficult. It kind of did this in and out. Either way, if, if I get anything written, uh, chances are you'll find out about it here first. Do you think that your education has helped you in the creation of your videos? Yeah, I think my education, my specific education has definitely helped. Drama school and the animation course I was on opened so many doors to practical knowledge and, and theories just by being in that space and wanting to seek things out in that space. Really helped me to find out how to articulate things I'd always felt or improve on things I was totally wrong about. Sometimes I didn't go through those doors, which were open to me, and I should have done, so I don't think I always made the most of it, uh, and, I, and I do regret that. I also think the videos themselves are still teaching me things. The, the, the selfish truth is that there is much about me trying to figure out how I feel about the world and seeing if I can make it hold up in front of an audience as much as it's about trying to teach any concrete lessons. I keep discovering new things this way through the process and through the reactions I get. My education just never stops. So it's my existing interest and creative baggage that propels the videos in the end. I guess there's a saying about everything being a learning curve. I, I don't know where it's from. It's somewhere old, I guess maybe inside a tree. How applicable do you feel is the concept of creative syntax for characters outside of video games? I mean, it's definitely an idea applicable to every medium, that, that's a certainty. I think every work of fiction or presentation strives for cohesion between information and appearance. Uh, wardrobe, body language, dialogue, all has to work together to sell you on who a character is inside of their specific world. Think about Jurassic Park. All the scientists are visually different from each other and tell us different things about the kind of people they are, but there's something about each of them that roots them in both their work and the environment of the film that they've willingly entered. You only buy this being in a movie about those because we built to that moment by letting you know the kind of guy Ian Malcolm is. That is one big pile of shit. Now I want to stress, creative syntax, I wouldn't use it too liberally, uh, it's very much an unofficial, potentially bullshit term I came up with, to really just sell the importance of visual clarity being married with narrative clarity. It was just something that struck me at the time as the right way to portray that for the moment. Artists are better now than they've ever been. Uh, we're in an amazing time where there's so much the internet can, can bridge and teach you, and so many good artists sharing their methods, but I think we sometimes push for boundless creativity, which is very important, uh, in places where it definitely needs some finessing. Like in narrative spaces, you can really make whatever you want, but if you're wondering why things aren't getting you to that next step with an audience, I honestly think it's because the, the basic narrative cohesiveness gets less focus and attention than it really should do. Everyone wants to make the next big crazy spectacle with everything happening at once, and more power to them for pushing visual boundaries, but they often end up becoming horribly convoluted and lose the simplicity of the original idea that was so appealing to begin with. Just all this unconnected extraneous stuff as if it's really worried about losing the audience. You, you need a strong foundation to build a great house on, and it's totally possible, and more effective in many ways, to make something that's born from the simplest, most basic idea, and build from that into all the wacky, crazy places you want without ever losing the audience emotionally and logically. Does it make sense? I mean, maybe this is also all bullshit, so in that case, um, oh well. Have you ever cried at a piece of visual art? Uh, very often, uh, and often for very specific reasons. It, it happens a lot, there's loads of examples, but I guess ones that stick out right now. Uh, the ending of The Iron Giant gets me going, like the very end, uh, just because it's so triumphant in the face of, you know, all the shit he's gone through. Almost there, just because it was the first time I'd seen something on the big screen where I'm like, holy shit, they get it. That, that was wonderful. Uh, Sondheim's gay shit. Chorus line. Uh, chorus line at the moment is really getting me because, you know, it's, it's an amazing example of where pure genius, just the fact that something that cruel that works on so many different levels, that ending, but there, that one, that one gets me. If you, if you meant like, I assume you mean things in motion, if you meant like a painting, uh, then no, no, I, uh, if I remembered a, a thing that I don't remember. What's your opinion on the Infamous games? Do you think they're worthy follow-ups to Sly? Not a long answer here, I, I haven't played enough of them. I played the first one and really enjoyed what I saw, and I saw some of the same magic that Sucker Punch brought to the table there, but, um, I want to play them once I'm done with Sly completely and have a, a total palate cleanser and experience them for the first time properly. It would be a good change of pace. Having said all of that, there is already an amazing video that just came out that Nova Canoe did, my, my good buddy, and it's really good. you you got to watch it. That boy is uh, beefing up his dialogue and going to some, some seriously good places. He crams all that shit in in about half an hour, maybe less, and it's all great, so please check that out. Were you planning on doing a full ukulele video? I totally understand if not, I'm just curious. I should probably clear this up, huh. Alright, let's uh, do that.
Uh, everyone has said this, Donkey's video was a shock. I was mostly looking forward to the game because I'm, believe it or not, a really big fan of the stuff Rare released on the Xbox before Kinect stumbled in drunk one night and said, let's fuck up our lives. Now I know, they, they weren't all perfect, I'm not saying that they were above reproach or anything, aside from Viva Pinata, but they really pushed themselves to be different and to diversify Rare's portfolio. There's, there's some amazing new mechanics they were trying out that uh, led to some good shit. I, I've never actually been the biggest fan of the original Banjo. I appreciate a lot of what it did and I think it's got some great great moments, but I, I wasn't a fan of it uh, growing up, uh, even though, you know, I grew up with a lot of platformers and loved them. So I was excited to see a maybe older, more mature Rare go back to something like that and see what their new perspective could bring to it, how they could improve the experience. Now the Donkey video comes out, and I felt his wording was, at best, vague. I don't hold him accountable for Amazing Games criticism or anything, but, but you could see people popping up like weeds and going, hey, you just don't get platformers, man. Everything you're saying, well, that's what true platformer fans like. I mean, this is a slight straw man, but there was an element of that going on. And, you know, a small part of me felt the same at the time. Because I thought, you know, hey, I'm the platformer guy, right? I I'll be able to figure it out, right? Nobody else had said that or thought that, right? Because, you know, I'm the platformer, man. I'm all about those B-grade platformers. Yeah, t this is maybe not a wise move. So I play through the whole game, I record the footage, and I hate it. I hate this game. More than I expected, I am shocked by how angry I am, mostly because I feel like it's a terrifically uninspired effort at its very core. In a way, even the platformers it was based on were not. Worst part is the game is constantly laughing about how great it is to be away from corporate mandates, which would be very funny if it wasn't so shit. I always assumed those mandates were holding those Xbox games back. I, I, I played those and thought, wow, if they weren't pressured, maybe this would be even better. But, but no, I now see maybe Rare were just always doomed to deliver something that feels like the dog food version of the previous course. Like, it looks like food, but it ain't. I am genuinely heartbroken by the experience because I really, really wanted to like this game. And, and you can see the problem already, right? My script was terrible because it came across, by and large, as just another angry review. I, I kind of see Donkey's problem. You have to be absurdly precise in your criticisms because the game is so bland that anyone can simply pop up and say, well, uh, that's just what happens in platformers. You don't play enough. And God help me, I, I didn't have the nerve or the articulation at the time to pin it down. Every argument I made, I hated. I, I felt just as vague and just as typical, and I began to get really down about my own ability to write. It, it was like I was doing what anybody else would do, just adding to a pile of unhelpful, impotent rage, and I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't just release that as a video. It wasn't substantial. The Crash video was coming out soon, and I was desperate to pull myself back in and not screw that up, and keep a reasonably decent rate of videos coming out that weren't rushed and terrible. I pushed myself, and I just got it done, and it came out okay. It saved me. Uh, just knowing I could work on a video and get it done and not have the world collapse if it wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. It could it could just happen, mostly because it's something I really wanted to talk about and not something I just felt obligated to do. So, Ukulele didn't get reviewed because at the time it may very well have been the worst video ever and at the expense of my mental health and productivity. Now, I did make a promise to myself, which was that I'm staying away from new games unless I really feel I've got something worthwhile to contribute. I stand by everything I said in the Hat in Time video or the Mario Odyssey video, but I don't think I always articulated myself as clearly and as strongly as I would have liked because I, I felt very pressured in my brain, I was pushing myself in a bad way, and I dropped the ball on a few points that I think really ruined my observations. Like, it, it's not a plumby mask, it's, it's clearly a, it's a cherry, it's a cherry bomb, you silly idiot. And I kind of figured that when I saw it in the boss, like mentally I went, oh, a cherry bomb, I get it. But it obfuscated the real issue, which is why and how do I know to put a ghost inside of it? Like, who does that? Not my grandfather. So I want to take greater care in the future and, and work on stuff in the time that I feel is right for the project. You know, the Sly 2 video took two months of rewrites and I think it was worth it in the end. I'm doing a lot of legwork on the Spyro video as a result of this, because I already know those games well and I just want to make sure I've got all of my bases covered without rushing into things and pushing it in a direction that, that I'll hate and will just put me over time. So, fingers crossed that video should be interesting at the very least when it happens. And that would have all been the end of the ukulele saga in my mind. But I saw a couple of indefensive ukulele videos pop up out of the woodwork as time went on, some feeling a little contentious in their suggestions about why an audience was upset at the game. Uh, one guy, one fella in particular, called out a lot of critics online for being a bunch of donkey copycats, borrowing points close to release or rushing through the game in order to capitalise on a timely topic. Not a wholly unfair point on the general state of mainstream online reviews, I, I get that. Something I mostly just put down to unoriginality and, and money rather than a conspiracy against ukulele, shall we say. 
He didn't quite seem to delineate his stance clearly, given that many of his own meandering tangents, often as much criticism as praise itself, tended to directly cross over or even agree with the more concise, generalised complaints he was attacking. Sure, I I've got my own issues with Nitro Rad and his reviews, but didn't he go in after the negative backlash and end up defending the game in spots as well, Mola? It released a very lukewarm review, some critics giving it terrible scores. Even YouTubers I love and trust didn't seem to like it. Since everybody seems to be getting let down by going in with such high expectations, I'm gonna be going in a lot more cautiously optimistic. In the end, I did enjoy myself though, you know, just not the entire time. Does that not undermine your point somewhat about complete uniformity across review channel's intentions, given you chose to intersplice only his criticisms and not his praise? Gosh, do I, do I dare poke a guy with 70k plus subs? It's, is this wise? Is it fair to him? Is this really gonna lead to anything constructive? Well, uh, probably not. Uh, you know, I, I don't really know what can be achieved here. He's already tried to convince people that any intense dislike for ukulele is purely a business decision. I'm sure no more of a business decision than bloating single topics into multiple monetizable parts, and calling extremely pedantic observations and checklisting in a muddy, directionless argument a critique. Hey, you know, <laughs> all bets off the table. I, I know I'm one to talk, I'm far from without sin, and this is hardly a well-rounded rebuttal, but man, if you're gonna target other YouTubers, I highly recommend double-checking your methods. You and I are also fair game. Brevity is the soul of wit. The point being, of course, that it was what I expected to happen to me had I made a video too. That any criticism would be ignored unless I foolproofed it within an inch of its life. And nothing would be learnt. All the mistakes would be repeated in the future to what is now a fraction of the first game's audience. I watch those feelings of dissatisfaction, regardless of how well they're argued, get swept under the rug and out of sight. And I feel... I, I feel like maybe I shouldn't have been such a coward. Maybe I should have been a part of that, if I really cared. Maybe I should have said... something. But I didn't, and given where I went when I tried, I don't know if I ever will. Which makes me calling someone out kinda trivial. So no, uh, no review plan, Shane. Sorry mate. Anyway, thank you everyone for sticking by. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know how, I think this video might lose you all somehow, I don't know. It's, it's good that you're here, and I really appreciate everybody who supports me uh, in this mad endeavour. My Patreon followers have been nothing but supportive in the months that I've been up and down, and my Discord users have also been very friendly and nice and, and offered some uh, support just by being able to goof off and have fun. It's a no-chill server, it's very goofy, but in all seriousness, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little community. If you want to check in to see if that's not the case, please do. And if you want to support me on Patreon, that's great too. I want to give another shout out uh, to a couple of people. Cloud Cuckoo Country for being a really great guy and helping with so many of the video scripts. Shannon Hobby and Corgi Sword for being uh, just great sports in, in getting the voices done for the video. And maybe I can use them on a future project. Shammy in the PSD podcast is a fun time. If you're not listening to that, go listen to it. It's fucking good. Mr. Clemson Gaming Bridge for a lot of emotional support and just hanging out and being cool guys. And, uh... More love for Mr. Shame, please. Uh, he's more, more, more. Why does he have less subs? What the fuck is going on? Give this boy more views. He makes really good Sonic videos. Everybody thinks I'm a fucking furry. I am doing myself absolutely no favors. At this point, do I just <laughs> do I just live the lie online? Do I just review nothing but but furry platformers? Is that is that my life now? Is that where I've come to? Did did you rub my lamp? Did you bring me here? Did you wish for fur? Mm, of course you did. You're the internet. You, what what you want, you get. It's some kind of heathen demon. My leg has fallen asleep. This is a good time to end everything.